We want to thank you for joining us for what is going to be an informative presentation. We would like to start, dive right in, um, but first I would like to introduce our two presenters from Drug Free Kids Canada. Drug Free Kids Canada is a national registered charity whose mission is to reduce the prevalence of problematic substance use by youth. Tonight we have Chantal and Steve with us. Chantal is the executive director of Drug Free Kids Canada. She holds a bachelor's degree in communications from the University of Ottawa and a master of business administration from Laurentian University. Chantal's work engages parents and youth to have ongoing non-judgmental dialogue about substance use, to promote healthy decision-making and reduce cannabis and other substances related harms. Steve is the program developer for Drug Free Kids Canada. He graduated from Trent University's Bachelor of Education program and has been supporting youth through facilitating mental health and addictions programming since 2015. Steve is a passionate and energetic public speaker who enjoys helping exchange knowledge between credited research and audiences across Canada. So we wanna get started and jump right in. So I'm gonna pass things over to Steve. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andrea. And again, as you mentioned, my name is Steve Keller. I am uh, the program developer, as you said, for Drug Free Kids Canada. This is uh, kind of fun for me. Like I was, I was saying to Andrea just a little while ago, I've recently transitioned from my my previous program into this one, and it's it's a lot of fun to get to do this this discussion and this presentation sitting, I suppose, on the same side of the table as Chantel tonight, which is is going to be a lot of fun. Now, what we're going to be discussing is, is, is really a spotlight on multiple substances. We're going to be discussing cannabis, alcohol, vaping, as well as tobacco, and really taking a look at sort of two aspects. The first half of the presentation, which I'll be facilitating, is, is really looking at the, the data and, and the existing knowledge that we've seen from, from multiple resources across Canada. And on the next slide, I, I have quite a few of them. Um, we've looked at resources from, from Stats Canada. We've looked from the, the law enforcement section, the correction section, Health Canada, in addition to a wide variety of national reporting data from about 2019 to this past year, 2022. Uh, these include the Canadian Student Tobacco Alcohol and Drug Survey, the Canadian Alcohol and Drug Survey, the Canadian Post-Secondary Education Alcohol and Drug Survey, Canadian Tobacco and Nicotine Survey, as well as the Canadian Cannabis Survey. I do have to acknowledge these resources, but what I want you to understand is that what we're going to be looking at is trends that we've seen amongst different national reporting surveys such as these. You're going to see that if you were to look at each one of these sort of on their own, you would find the questions and the data they collect to be slightly different, but you will see trends that emerge overall, and we're going to touch on those tonight. Finally, we, we took a, an extensive look into our own resources to ensure that the things we were speaking about remain consistent with the, with the context and, and the subject matter that Drug Free Kids has, has long been able to share. So some of the, the information you're going to see tonight comes from the Cannabis Talk Kit, as well as the Youth and Alcohol and Youth and Vaping pieces, all of which you can find on Drug Free Kids' website at drugfreekidscanada.org. Without further ado, let's get right into it. Now, during this presentation, you're going to see a series of poll questions. I'm going to pull the first one up here right now. You can vote on it live. And the question that we have is, true or false, it is best to wait to speak with youth about substance use until they turn 19. This is a common response we hear from parents. They may not feel comfortable having their youth learning about substances or having that conversation. And a lot of it really comes out of a concern that they don't want youth to think that that means they should be starting to use. But what do we think? Is this true or is this false? I'll give you a few more moments. We'll close this poll down in three, two, and one. Poll is now closing. All right, so it looks like the, the vast majority of our audience, in fact, everyone who voted, thank you those who did, uh, did vote uh, that this is indeed false. And you would be correct, right? The reason that we say this statement is false is that the average age that youth try substances for the first time is as young as 13 years old on average. Now we know there are youth that will actually report first time use even younger, which we'll talk about here in the next couple slides. But when we look at alcohol and tobacco, the average age of first time initiation is around 13. Cannabis is slightly older, it comes in around 14. And with that in mind, we, we wanna understand that conversations around substance use need to begin before or early on during times whereby substances may be used by youth, because this will have the greatest opportunity and chance to stem the risk of harmful use or to prevent harmful use. 
In fact, in a, a tracking report conducted by Drug Free Kids Canada, uh, what we actually found was that two thirds of teenagers between the age of 13 to 19 in Canada actually report getting information about drugs from their parents and, and from things that they learn at school. So sometimes we may hear parents or, or adults say, well, I don't know if my kid's listening. And the data really shows that they are. And that's why we encourage you to have these conversations. And if you're, you're wondering how to have them, Chantel will certainly speak to that in the second half of this workshop. Now, if we know that youth use substances, one of the first things that's important to understand is why do they use? Now, every youth's reason for using substances can be different. And the reasons that they start using may be completely different from the reasons they continue. But from what we've seen in our research, the most common reasons that youth may choose to use substances include curiosity, pleasure, social factors such as fitting in or, or peer pressure, uh, coping and stress, the, the influence of media, as well as any perceived medical benefits. Now, this is especially the case with things like cannabis, whereby you may hear youth and young adults talk about the fact that they use cannabis for medical purposes, just as we would hear adults over 25 say that they may have a medical license to use cannabis or they use for self-medicating reasons. Now, if we understand the reasons that youth choose to use cannabis, the idea that maybe they have fun when they're impaired or they want to see what it's like, one question that we like to always ask as well is, why might youth choose not to use? Well, the first thing that we see is, is a fear of consequences, right? These aren't just legal consequences or punitive consequences. It's not just, I'm afraid of getting in trouble. This could be the fear of the, the effect on the body, the fear to health, right? If we use cannabis as that example, some people may say that they're curious about using cannabis, but they don't want to use because they've heard it can have adverse effect on the brain or adverse effect on the lungs. Or if they've been keeping up on the research, it can have adverse effects to the heart. Some people may choose not to use for any perceived negative experiences. Someone may choose not to consume alcohol because they don't want to hang over. Someone may choose not to smoke cigarettes because they don't want to have that cough all the time that, that they may hear someone who smokes having. Some people's values and opinions about substance use may dictate they choose not to use. But the other factor that, that may play into this is the idea of stigma. Now, stigma is the negative sort of thoughts and, and attitudes and beliefs that we have towards a person or a situation, which may cause us to treat them differently. Uh, so in essence, youth may choose not to use cannabis because they don't want to be judged for using. They may not choose to, to, to vape because they don't want to be perceived in a certain way if they chose to vape. They may not use harder substances because they don't want to be perceived as, as being sort of rebellious or, or somehow immoral for choosing to use because there's that, that fear of being judged that way. But one thing I'd like to point out on this slide is that there's really an idea of empathy and communication that goes on here. Some people use cannabis. Some people use substances for health reasons. They choose not to for health reasons. Some people choose to use for social factors, the idea of fitting in. They choose not to because they don't want to be judged. So what we really like to bring up in this conversation is, is to remind you and to remind youth to consider the reasons they have for using, because everyone's are different. And just like we, we want to make sure people are respectful of, of those who choose not to use, we do still have to be respectful of those who choose to use as well. Even though we will try to prepare them with skills and, and tips to reduce harm and may bring up some reasons that it might be a better idea to wait. Now, the next full question that we have is as follows. Which age range reports the highest rate of substance use overall? Now, this includes tobacco, alcohol, cannabis, and vaping. Is it teens, young adults, adults, or seniors? What do we think? All right, seeing a lot more votes coming in quickly here. Give you guys a few more moments. Got just about everybody voted. Close it up here in three, two, and one. Polls now closing. All right, so we have a bit of a divide. Looks like most people are saying young adults, but we do have some votes for adults in and of themselves. The correct answer that we see here is young adults between the ages of 20 to 24. They actually report the highest rate of not just tobacco use, alcohol use, cannabis, and vaping, but they also report a higher prevalence of use towards harder drugs, as well as potentially dependent behaviors, for example, gambling as well. This age range reports the highest rate of overall substance use in Canada, and if we were to compare teens to adults over the age of 25, we know that teens actually report higher rates of vaping and cannabis use than adults over the age of, of 25. 
But one thing that we do like to point out, if you look at the numbers here for ages 15 to 19, we see alcohol use is at 37%, vaping at 14%, which is significant. Cannabis at 11, tobacco at 6. These are significant numbers, but they're not the majority. This is a, this is a fact and, a, and a, a, a really a point we want to get across to youth as well. So there's a misconception among teens that, that really everyone is using drugs. Everybody's doing it, right? Well, this message isn't really, it's not only incorrect, but it can also influence youth to try substances if they believe other people are doing it. It goes back to that, that social factor idea that I mentioned a moment ago. So one thing that we like to point out, and we encourage parents to do this, is to remind youth that substance use is actually in the minority and that any decisions about substance use, just as I said on the previous slide, need to be based on the youth's own background, their own medical history, and their own considerations of their value and what's going on in their life. Now, one thing I noted is this is based on the 2020 CTNS report. About a year later, we actually saw that vaping among young adults jumped up from 13% uh, to 17%. So the whole chart you're seeing is, is from 2020, but there was one number that updated in 2021, and that was vaping among young adults. The rest remain fairly consistent. Another graph I like to show, because I'm just obsessed with numbers, is to consider past 12 month use of the two most common substances used by youth, which are alcohol and, and cannabis, right? If we, look at if we look at cannabis first, in grade seven, we see about 2% of youth report past year use of cannabis. So at about age 11 or 12, one in 50 youth report cannabis use. Now that number increases to around one in eight by grade nine, 40% in grade 12, and slightly over half of post-secondary students by the time they hit third year. These are very significant numbers, but it's worth noting again in the high school range that the use of cannabis is not over 50%. Alcohol is a little different. Alcohol, the overall number is below 50 if you factor in all of the younger age group. However, alcohol consumption does raise significantly after about grade nine, as we see grade 10, 11, 12, up to those years of post-secondary, to the point where by the start of university and, and college, it's actually estimated that five out of every six young adults in college and university consume alcohol. That could be either on a weekly, near daily, or daily basis. So this is a commonly and, and in many cases, heavily consumed substance. One reason we hear for this that people say is they say, well, alcohol is legal. It's, it's been legal for a long time. And if cannabis was legalized, one concern was that this would cause a, a significant increase in cannabis use. We have enough research to actually see what happened in the years following legalization with teens. So my question for you is this. Cannabis use among teens between the ages of 12 to 17 did what after legalization? Did it double? Did it cut in half? Did it decrease slightly? Did it increase slightly? What do we think? I also realized I was reading from the bottom coming up on that, so I apologize. But, uh, looks like just about all the votes are in. Got a couple more coming in, so I'll give you guys a couple more moments. Perfect. A divide here, not quite a certainty. Some people say there was a decrease, some people say there was an increase, some people say the number doubled. This is actually an example of if you look at multiple surveys, they'll actually tell you different things. But what we found from the Canadian Student Tobacco, Alcohol, and Drug Survey, which is the largest collection of youth in this age range, they surveyed about 66,000 youth at the time. What they found was the increase was only slight. Pre legalization, rates of cannabis use among teens in high school was about 16%. Post-legalization, the number sat around 17%. We didn't see a significant increase as a result of legalization. Now, there's a bit of a different story with COVID. COVID really threw off a lot of numbers with substance use, and cannabis was no exception. During the COVID period, we did see a more significant increase. But legalization didn't really factor into this. What it did factor into actually leads into one of the questions that, that came up in the, the emails that we saw coming into this presentation. And that's the idea of disclosing substance use. In 2019, the first year after legalization, we found that 44% of teens said they were more likely to tell people that they used cannabis since it became legal. In 2021, people willing to disclose use after legalization rose to about 50%. But what we also found was that despite this, youth who use cannabis for medical purposes are actually very highly unlikely to do so with medical consultation. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, 
I mentioned earlier that a reason for substance use can be perceived medical benefits. What we found in 2022 is that 10% of teens aged 16 to 19 and 14% of young adults said that one of the reasons they used cannabis was for medical purposes. But despite that, 81% of young adults who could legally get a, uh, a medical license to purchase medical cannabis had never actually done so and had not actually consulted with a healthcare provider about using cannabis for medical purposes. One of the questions that came up in the email that we saw leading into this presentation was what could be done when we ask youth to disclose to a doctor whether or not they're using substances and they don't. One of the things that we, we like them to understand is that they need to disclose substance use to a medical professional for many reasons. The first could be in case they interact with other medications they're using, or if certain health conditions in their life could be worsened or, or compromised by the use of substances. In the case of alcohol, this could be significant damage to a multitude of vital organs. Obviously, tobacco and vaping, this can be issues with the lungs, the heart, and the brain. With cannabis, this can also be the lungs, heart, and the brain. But cannabis can also worsen symptoms of anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, psychosis, and schizophrenia, while ongoing research actually shows an increasingly apparent link between adolescent cannabis use and the onset of schizophrenia and psychosis, especially among youth with a history of these conditions. We also know that some medications can interact negatively with substances, and I'll use cannabis here as an example. Heart medications, diabetes medications, seizure medications, and birth controls, some research has actually shown could have potentially risky or even dangerous uh, effects on the body if used while a person's using cannabis, as many of these medications can cause changes in blood pressure. Adding cannabis can make these changes even more pronounced, as both THC and CBD, the two active compounds in cannabis that we research to a great extent, can also cause changes in blood pressure. This can cause dizziness, this can cause passing out, this can even cause cardiac episodes that may require hospitalization. So we like to point out that if a youth is using a substance, they should be willing to discuss this with their healthcare provider because what's most important in that conversation is that the healthcare provider can provide them the healthcare they need, thus the title. If a healthcare provider doesn't know what a youth is using, they can't give them proper advice or adequate advice to support whatever need they have for coming in there. So what we like to do is remind youth to have that conversation with their doctor, to have that conversation with their healthcare provider, because that's the best way that they're going to get the most honest and, and, and supportive mechanisms that they need from that healthcare sector. Which of the following skills can be affected by the presence of cannabis in the brain? We have work in school, driving, mood regulation, or all of the above. Audience is voting quite quickly. This is wonderful. We're going to close it up here in just a moment. I see we've got almost everyone voted. I close it up in three, two, and one. Poll is now closing. All right. So I see 100% of you said that all of these things can be impacted by the presence of THC in the brain. The THC, of course, being tetrahydrocannabinol, in this case, delta 9 THC, which we know can cause impairment. It's a substance that alters the way we think, feel, and act but it can impact all of these factors as well. One of the questions that came up in the email that we saw this week was, was research and, and evidence about the impact of substance use on brain development. So when we look at cannabis in particular in the brain, there are various resources that point out these risks. Now, the short-term risks include the loss of coordination, confusion and disorientation, anxiety, fear and panic attack, uh, impaired memory and concentration, as well as reduced reaction time and depth perception. Now, the long-term risks can include memory loss, dependency, effects to decision-making and problem-solving, as well as mental health risks, such as worsening or onset of depression, anxiety disorders. Now, some research has also linked long-term cannabis use to the increased risk of suicidal ideations or even suicidal attempts. Um, we also see significant psychological risks, for instance, the onset of psychosis, and schizophrenia. Now, again, these risks are elevated for people who use cannabis before the age of 25 because the brain is still developing during that time. Now, what percentage of youth between the ages of 15 to 19 who reported vaping in the past 30 days had never tried a tobacco cigarette in their life? And we're going to shift gears away from a cannabis discussion to a vaping discussion. One of the things that we know about vaping is that its initial intent, the initial intent behind vaping 
was to act as a smoking cessation tool. Now, whether or not it still does that is really where the conversation is going to start. So my poll question is, what percentage of teens have never actually tried a tobacco cigarette who report vaping? All right. So it looks like the majority of our audience is saying 61%. It's a fairly high number with a couple of people guessing 46. Unfortunately, you would be correct. Almost two thirds of teens in 2021 that said they were vaping had actually never otherwise tried tobacco in their life. And like I said, the initial intent behind vaping was to help adults quit smoking tobacco. But yet, despite that, we've seen increasingly this shift from vaping being used as a smoking cessation tool to being its own mechanism for a person to continue ingesting substances. And one of the most common that we see in, ingested through, through e-cigarettes and, uh, and vaporizers is nicotine. In fact, in 2018, it became legal for e-liquids to include nicotine, and some provinces have actually since mandated, due to the confusion about whether or not e-cigarettes contain nicotine, some provinces, for example, in Atlantic and Western Canada, have actually mandated that all vape cartridges in their province must contain nicotine because it clarifies to the audience what's in that product that's being sold to them. In the case of vaping and cannabis, one of the things to note is that vape cartridges and vape products with cannabis can actually contain over 90% tetrahydrocannabinol. Now, this is anywhere from, from three to nine times more potent than what we would see in dried leaf cannabis products. So for instance, if someone were to smoke a joint or smoke a bong, the average THC potency they would find would come in at around maybe 15 to 30% on the high end, but vape cartridges can be even 90 to 95% THC. Now, the long-term effects of chemicals in vape products do remain largely unknown. This is why it's recommended that youth in particular avoid the use of, of vape cartridges, especially during teenage years and, and young adulthood. We see increased risk of dependency, and furthermore, we just don't know the long-term health ramifications of the chemicals that we see in vape cartridges. Now, one of the questions that we saw come up in the email was, was a little bit more information on vaping. Now, Drug-Free Kids does have a great deal of, of really helpful stuff right on our website, uh, drugfreekidscanada.org, which did recently uh, launch with a nice and beautiful new design. And I, I do encourage you to check it out to, to learn a little bit more about vaping if, if you're curious. Now let's look at substance use in general again. What percentage of Canadians but over the age of 15 actually report using multiple substances at a time? So maybe they smoke and they vape. Maybe they drink and they smoke. Maybe they use cannabis and they smoke. Maybe they do more than two. What do we think? All right. Looks like we've got quite a few people voting one way at least, looks like everyone's voted. Thank you all. Looks like the vast majority is saying 21% with a couple of people saying 9%. The answer is actually not quite as high as you would think. It's about one in eight, comes in around 12% of, of Canadians over age 15 reporting mixing substances. Now this is most commonly reported by teens and young adults. It's most commonly reported by males and it's most commonly reported by those who report vaping. Those who report vaping are more likely to also use tobacco and also use alcohol and also use cannabis. But yet, despite that, the actual most common combination of any two substances is alcohol and cannabis. Now, there are risks of mixing substances together. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with, with, uh, with alcohol and cannabis because we know they can be the most pressing. But this can be alcohol and, and opioids. This can be cannabis and opioids. This could be stimulants like cocaine and fentanyl. Or, or use of heroin and fentanyl. There's, there's so many risks to consider when you mix substances together. The first is the unpredictability of, of mixing substances. For instance, if you mix a sedative like a benzodiazepine and fentanyl, one of the risks we see here is that the sedative properties of, of a benzo may actually increase the risk of an individual overconsuming or, or fatally overdosing. Now, I mentioned fatal there, and we'll, we'll talk about why in a bit. Second, we see the increased risk of impaired driving. A 2012 report from Mad Canada actually found that uh, cannabis consumption before driving increases the risk of a fatal collision by five times. But if an individual mixes alcohol and cannabis together, that risk increases to 40 times. 
Third risk we see is hospitalization. Back in 2019, it was estimated that 40% of youth who were hospitalized due to substance-related harms had reported using cannabis. And of that, 18% of that was, you know, cannabis and something else. The other 22% was cannabis alone. So there's still that risk of hospitalization with mix, with mixing substances. We also see long-term health risks that can rise from, say, consuming cannabis and tobacco together, as the use of tobacco introduces more carcinogens. And again, most seriously, we see the risk of overdose or possible fatality. Next poll question. I think I just have two more after this one. The poll question I have here is this. In 2020, more youth in colleges and universities reported driving within two hours of consuming alcohol or cannabis. What do we think? Looks like we've got all the votes in. A bit of a split here. A bit of a split. Looks like we've got some people saying alcohol and others are saying cannabis. So we're in a 38-63 split. The answer here is actually cannabis, and it's quite significant. In 2020, it was estimated that about 17% or one in six people that use cannabis reported driving within two hours of smoking or vaping. But only 8.9% of alcohol consumers reported driving within two hours of consuming drinks. Cannabis impaired driving is actually more commonly reported. And one of the things that we've seen in, in the research is while this message is changing, some youth actually believe that, that cannabis does not have an adverse effect on their ability to drive. But as we know, it can cause issues with, with balance, with coordination, with reaction time, which can influence someone's ability to maintain speed and distance, stay within lines, or react to sudden changes on the road. And as we know, driving impaired by any substance is not only illegal and has been since 1925, but it does carry significant risk. Now, last year, it's also worth noting that teenagers were eight times more likely to report being a passenger with a cannabis impaired driver within the past 30 days if those teens themselves were using cannabis versus those who reported not using cannabis. So if someone was, was uh, using cannabis, they were eight times more likely, like I said, to, to get into a vehicle with an impaired driver. we tell if a youth is using? Is there, is there sort of telltale red flags or yellow flags that we, we want to really focus on? Well, this next poll question will touch on that. Which of the following may be a sign that a youth is using substances? Is it spending less time with family and friends? Is it declining performance at school or work? Is it abnormal health issues or sleeping habits? Or is it all of the above? All right, looks like just about everyone here has said all of the above. You would in fact be correct. All of these can be signs that a youth is using substances. Now I'm not gonna get into a deep elaboration on this response, but I do wanna point this fact out that, that comes up in one of the reports that we have in, in our Cannabis Talk Toolkit. And I, I think this is worded very elegantly and, and I don't think I can explain it beyond here. It's important not to jump to the conclusion that any change in child's behavior is specifically caused by substance use. Now, if you do notice these changes, if you notice that your child is becoming distant, if you notice that they're beginning to struggle at school, if you notice that they're, they're spending less time doing the things that they enjoy, this is not something that you, you then take to mean you have to accuse them of something. Instead, this is an opportunity to have an open and honest discussion with your youth. Your goal is to empower them, to ask them questions about what's going on in their life, to take an interest, to educate them with the information that, that you may have if they ask you a question about substance use. And most importantly, it's to offer any support that you can. We also understand that even if a child is using a substance, or even if a young adult discloses, or even if someone in their 40s is using a substance, we understand that substance use exists on a spectrum. And what that means is that not all substance use is problematic, but substance use can become problematic. So the spectrum begins with non-use. This is the people that don't use drugs, they don't use tobacco, they don't use alcohol. This is really the abstinence point, right? Second step we see here is beneficial use. This is prescribed legal use of a substance that with, with medical attention, with medical supervision, with consultation with a healthcare professional, can actually have positive health, social, or spiritual effects. Beneficial use can even mention sort of using prescriptions, right? Prescription substances can be risky. 
But if you use them with proper, proper supervision, they're far less likely to present dangers. Where we see lower risk use is when an individual is using a substance that may have minimal impacts to their life. Perhaps they're drinking alcohol and every so often they have a hangover. Perhaps they're smoking tobacco and they found they've, they've developed a dry cough, but, but they're still you know, so taking care of other things in their life. Where we see higher risk use is where the use is beginning to have a harmful and increasingly negative impact on the person's life. If they continue to use tobacco, for instance, and that cough evolves into a more consistent cough, they find their, their cardiovascular health is deteriorating. Perhaps as they get older, they may find that they're experiencing issues with heart disease or complications in their, their respiratory system. And where we see addiction and disordered use, this is a treatable medical condition that involves compulsive use of a substance despite negative effects. Now, it's important to note that people can move back and forth between these stages over time. We don't just always see progression from low-risk use to addiction. Some people will spend most of their life in low-risk use if they're using a substance. This could be someone that drinks alcohol once every couple of weeks. Someone else may start drinking and go up to five or six beers a week, then five or six beers a day. They may find after a while they quit. They may find they continue. They may find they struggle with dependency for months or years on end. But no matter where they are on the spectrum, it's never too early or too late to seek support and treatment for whatever it is that, that is going on in their life to reduce the possibility of being harmed by substance use. Now, finally, when I talk about harms, what do those actually look like? Well, substance use can, can show harms in, in a myriad of ways. These can be seen physically with issues with tolerance and dependence. Um, physical complications of withdrawal. For instance, someone trying to quit drinking alcohol may experience some um, potentially significant issues that we would call DTs or delirium tremens, which can actually cause changes in, in heart rate, changes in, um, in sort of physical, physical feeling, um, increased sweatiness, a fever, migraine. In serious cases, DTs can even be fatal. Uh, withdrawal from something like cannabis can, can cause things like panic attacks, anxiety attacks, uh, nausea, headaches. Withdrawal from tobacco use, we know, can cause irritability and migraines when nicotine is no longer being introduced to the body. We see issues with cancer and additional health risks, as well as bloodborne infections, especially for people that are, say, sharing needles with harder substances. Behavioral risks we see include isolation, breaking laws, impulsive decisions, or impaired driving. And the psychological issues we see can include impaired focus, increased stress, depression, or anxiety. Onset of psychological conditions such as psychosis or schizophrenia, as well as hallucinations, delusions, and mood changes. Now, the very last poll question I have for you is this one here. Overall, the rates of dependent use are higher among people who use alcohol or cannabis. Some people say neither of these substances is addictive. They say, well, I drink because it's not addictive like tobacco. I smoke weed because it's not addictive like tobacco. There are rates of dependency for both of these. Which do you think is higher? All right. So it looks like most of our audience has said alcohol, about 71%. Looks like about 29% coming in to say cannabis. The correct answer is it's alcohol. We know that one in five Canadians age 15 plus meet criteria for alcohol abuse or dependence over their lifetime. And in fact, alcohol con use contributes to a greater cost to the healthcare system than the use of any other substance in Canada. Approximately 6 million Can Canadians over the age of 12 report heavy drinking, which is five or more drinks on a single occasion, at least once a month. And 200 different health diseases and health risks are associated with alcohol use. Alcohol is one of the only substances that damages every major vital organ in the body, including um, the oral care system, so gums, teeth, the tongue, the throat, stomach, intestines, the excretory system, the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system. And, and we know that withdrawal from systemic use can be dangerous and possibly fatal. So these risks are significant when we look at alcohol. Now, what about cannabis? Approximately 1 in 11 people who use cannabis in their lifetime will develop an addiction or dependency to using. But that number almost doubles if the individual begins using cannabis during their teenage years. This is why it's recommended that youth avoid the use of cannabis before age 25, as about 1 in 6 who use during teenage years will develop an addiction to cannabis use. And as we mentioned earlier, the use of cannabis, particularly THC, prior to age 25 can have an adverse effect on the youth brain development. And finally, if we look specifically at risks of tobacco and vaping, 
We know that approximately 125 people die due to smoking-related illnesses every single day in Canada. In fact, tobacco use is the leading cause of premature death in Canada. It directly is responsible for 48,000 fatalities per year. In fact, the World Health Organization reports that tobacco kills more than 8 million people a year worldwide. Now, if we shift gears and look at vaping, now why am I, why am I grouping these together? Well, a common reason that people choose to use nicotine or consume tobacco is to reduce stress. And in 2021, we found that a third of people, especially teens, that report vaping say they do so to reduce stress. But one of the things that needs to be pointed out here is that vaping can cause or worsen lung illnesses due to chemicals that are inhaled within the liquids themselves. As we mentioned, the cannabis e-liquids can be significantly more potent, which can cause the risk of overconsumption, a psychotic episodes, uh, delusions, paranoia, nausea, vomiting, and the long-term health risks of vaping are unknown. The long-term health risks of tobacco were debated for decades. The, the idea that, that lung cancer was directly associated with tobacco was really only explored in the 1940s and was really not even publicly accepted for about another 20 or 30 years. Now we know that tobacco can cause more than 40 different debilitating and fatal diseases in the lungs, heart, and other vital organs. So finally, I want to thank you all for the, the first half of the presentation. We certainly hope that you enjoy it. But what we do want to, uh, to get across before I move on is the strategies that we want you to, to be able to share to reduce the risks of substance use. These include delaying the use of substances like cannabis or alcohol until age 25, limiting consumption to occasional use, using cannabis products with low THC content, and avoid the use of synthetic cannabis products. These are known as uh, K2 or, or spice. They're designed to mimic the effects of cannabis, but they can actually cause significant organ damage. If you're drinking alcohol, it's recommended to avoid drinking more than three or four drinks on a single occasion and to mix in water and meals if a person's consuming. If you're traveling at all, regardless of what substance you use, you always want to designate a sober driver. If a person's using opioids, if they're using stimulants, if they're using sedatives, if they're, they're drinking, if they're smoking weed, we want to make sure they designate a sober driver to make sure they can get where they're going safely. Substance use is generally recommended to be avoided if you're pregnant, have a history of psychological disorders or past substance use disorders. And we always recommend that you speak with your doctor if you are using substances, whether you're a youth or a parent. It's worth noting if you, you haven't before to mention to your doctor if you use cannabis or if you use tobacco or if you've become vaping. They may have even more up-to-date, more relevant information in the coming months than what we've covered tonight. Always recommended to avoid mixing substances together. This can increase the risk of all sorts of unforeseen consequences. And finally, to use in a safe space with people that you trust and seek medical attention if needed. Now, again, I want to thank you all very, very much for allowing me to speak. I, I see I'm about five minutes over, so I'm going to very humbly pass along uh, the, uh, the microphone to uh, our executive director, Chantel. Thank you, everybody. Oh, good. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve, for that valuable information. Um, we didn't get a chance to do a land acknowledgement at the beginning, so I would just like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all lands we are on today. Um, we're meeting from different parts of, of Ontario. Um, I'm personally in Ottawa. I know Steve is in Peterborough, um, and our parents are in Mississauga. So while we meet on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home. So um, also want to take two minutes to say thank you to Andrea and offering us this opportunity to talk to the Cathar Park Secondary School um, uh, parents and uh, as well as the council for allowing us to be here. Um, also want to point out that um, we, Steve, as he was doing his presentation, was mentioning that there was some questions that were sent um, to us prior to our presentation. Some parents share them. Hopefully um, we're covering them as we speak. Um, but if there's any questions that you have as we're presenting tonight, please, please feel free to go in the Q&A and put the questions because we'll have some time at the end to answer any questions that you may have. So after I'm done doing my part of the presentation, we will go and visit those Q&A to see if um, any parents have additional uh, uh, question, but feel free to feed it as we're going along so that um, when we get to that part, we're all ready to go. There will also be a survey at the end. Um, quick, quick survey, it just helps us um, to uh, enhance the experience moving forward. So if you want to take just two minutes at the end. <laughs> 
so okay so these are all of my little opening remarks so we can i can start sharing my screen with you and get talking about how do we put this all of this valuable information into a dialogue with our teens so give me one second Perfect. So um, Steve has mentioned at the beginning of why it is important that we do talk about this. I think that we've given you a lot of reasons as to why early intervention as well as um, prevention is important. And when we're thinking about the average age of experimentation being 13 and 14 with alcohol and cannabis. Um, but some parents, I'm, uh, I'm the executive director of Dorf Free Kids, but I also happen to have two teenagers myself. I have a 17 year old and a soon to be 15 tomorrow daughter. Um, and I completely understand parents that go, what's the point? Like, I should maybe do a TikTok and they will watch it more than they will listen to me. They're a lot more interested in knowing what their friends have to say than what I have to say. Um, and I share that perspective every day. However, um, we've surveyed teenagers and when we go to them, 67% um, of teenagers across Canada say that their parents are their preferred source of information when it comes to substances and substance use. It's followed by school at 56% and friends are at 26%. So you may be, it, it's always a surprise. And I have to say that this is consistent. We do a tracking study every second year and every second year, those numbers are consistent. So in a focus group, you know, we're wondering why, why is it that your parents are the most reliable source of information? And actually kids will believe, think that you going to them with evidence-based, fact-based information, engaging in a dialogue with them, they believe that it comes from a place of love and they believe that you're credible. Whereas their friends, they may think that, you know, it's more peer pressure, they may not be as well informed, um, it, the information may not be well sourced. So they actually believe that you have their back, right? So however they don't want to initiate the conversation that's clear when we ask them they they'll listen they'll engage if you're initiating the conversation but they won't do it themselves and when we're asking parents that actually initiated the dialogue with their kids what was the result 95 percent of parents are reporting that having conversation with their child about substances had a positive influence on their child's behavior so we're here to tell you that you know, it's a good thing. Thank you for being there, but for being here tonight. That's a great way of getting information um, and engaging in this conversation. You can use this presentation tonight to say, I heard so many interesting facts and I'd like to share them with you and get your feeling on it. But at the end of the day, you do make a difference and we encourage you to have an ongoing dialogue. And the important part as well that I want to say is it's not so much having the talk. We used to say that, we used to hear that a lot. It's important to have the talk about drugs. Um, we're encouraging people to engage in an ongoing dialogue, normalize this conversation. Substances are part of our life. Uh, the fact that cannabis is legal for adults, um, the fact that alcohol is, is very, very socially acceptable. Um, it, it, it is, if it's part of our normal context, why shouldn't it be part of a normalized conversation with your teens? And the sooner you start, the easier it's going to be, the less intimidating it's going to be, and the less awkward it may feel. So we encourage you to start and start early. So how do we go about doing it? It's all good, but how do we really what could we do to facilitate the process? Um, so I'm going to share with you some discussion strategies that can be used um, to talk to teens. Stay educated, know the facts. So basically, as I mentioned, tonight is a great example of you going to find information. We often encourage parents to approach the subject with curiosity as opposed to judgment. Right, so I heard X, how do you feel about this? The purpose of getting educated and, and having this knowledge 
is to ensure that you know your your kid is going to respect that you've done your research and make them feel that you know you you do care and you want to get the facts you're not just trying to tell them no it's not a good thing um it's not so much about a moral issue as more as you're educating yourself you're concerned about their health and you want to have a healthy discussion about it um, and know the facts, again, should not be a reason for you to be intimidated to say some of you may not know much about those substances. Some of you may be using as well and may be um, intimidated to start a conversation about this. If you come on our website, we also have some different scenarios of where you are and how you could maybe have a, a, a conversation depending on where you are. But Again, it's okay to not know the facts and it's okay to say that's a really good question. Let's go and find the answer. It's showing vulnerability. It's showing that you don't know it all and you, it's showing where you can actually find credible information. Set goals for your conversation. So it all depends on what age your kids are at and I'm going to talk about age appropriate conversation, but you know, you may be wanting to know what they know about cannabis. So that may be the goal of the conversation. You know, I just want to find out what you know about THC, about CBD, about medicinal, do you know, um, and, and get the conversation going uh, about it. So that may be a good starting point. Keep an open mind. Um, you know, they may know more than you do. Um, they may have already used and you didn't know. Um, it's all about, as I said, approaching the matter with curiosity and an open mind and maybe setting your emotions in control. And it's not easy. I can appreciate that when you're a parent, it, it can be difficult and you may be um, uh, hearing things that you didn't expect. That's also okay to say that. And if you need to take a pause, that's also okay to say that too, you know? Okay, um, thank you for sharing all of this. Maybe we can revisit this um, in a day or two once I've had a chance to digest all this and think about it some more. Um, don't lecture, engage, it's the complete opposite of what I'm doing tonight, but basically it's meant to be a conversation. So try to seek their input, try to seek how they feel about you guys talking about this. Are they feeling somewhat anxious? Are they feeling um, shy about it? And you can say, I was feeling the same way before talking to you about it. Um, and why do you think that is? Why do you think we feel this way? So being able to engage and, and share the experience find a comfortable setting, um, you know, and ask part of the find a comfortable setting, going into their room and asking them, is this a good time? I'd love to talk to you about this. I've heard something about cannabis. I'd like to us to, to have a, a conversation about it. Is this a good time? Um, and let them set the terms. They may say it, it's not a good time right now, but you can be persistent about it and say, okay, so this may not be a good time right now, but Let's make sure we revisit this in a day or two because it's really important to me that we talk about it. And identify where in the continu continuum of use the youth is. Um, that really talks about what Steve was, was mentioning. Where are they? Are, are they, have they experimented yet? Uh, have they not? Um, uh, is, is, are we talking about a possible addiction here? So let's identify before like maybe you have an idea of where they are and then you'll be able to adapt whatever the conversation has to be when you're setting the goals according to where they are in their use. So I was talking about age appropriate conversations. It, it goes back to, and, and you know, we were mentioning this at the beginning, how early should I be talking about this? Should I wait until they're 17, 19, um, until they go to university? And um, basically we're saying the sooner the better. And it may surprise some of you that I'm starting with toddlers. What could I possibly say to toddlers? Well, at toddlers, you very keep it basic, but it's about a great time to set stage for healthy habits um, that will stay with them as they grow. We brush our teeth before we go to bed. We wash our hands, but we explain why those are healthy for you and you establish um, you establish those habits that, that they can keep as they go. Um, for preschool, three to five years old, these kids are confident, independent. Um, they're more aware of their surroundings. They love fantasy and make-believe and tea parties and dress up. 
um, they will notice everything that's going on. And that's the age where it's the why and why not. And they start asking a lot of questions. What we suggest is focus on how it feels good to be healthy, right? So talk about the importance of health, talk about the importance of a healthy body. You can introduce some notions about medicine and how medicine is good um, to cure some things or when we're sick, but they have a specific purpose and that medicine is not candy. For example, the vitamins that they take every day. When vitamin is good, it's not candy. They shouldn't be taking two. And introducing that notion that medicine has a specific purpose. Um, introduce the, uh, the some responsibilities for the kids and, and celebrate their good choices, right? So um, they want to be proud of themselves. They're really happy when they get praises. So it's important to start establishing some responsible behavior for them and praising them on it. Elementary school, so five to eight years old, they like routine, they love their family, they like to learn, they don't want to lose face, so they dislike failure, and just like the preschool, they love praises. At this point, we can start being clear on drugs and introducing the notion on drugs like tobacco and alcohol and letting them know that they're not good for their bodies and they can cause children to be sick. At five or eight years old, they understand that notion of healthy and sick. Um, find teachable moment when you're watching TV if or videos and you see um, if people are smoking in a, in a movie or, um, you know, start introducing the notion of what's healthy or not for a body and what can be harmful. Usually at this age, this introduction is enough. You don't have to go into much more details, understanding alcohol, tobacco, not good for me, being healthy, leave it at that. Um, however, if they have questions, this is not meant to be scripted. These are just suggestions. Everybody's kids is different. Their level of maturity is different, but um, you know your kids. If they ask more questions, just go along with it. But if they don't, you can leave it at that at that stage. Middle school. That's my next. Yeah, nine to 12 years old. They are growing more independent. They're vulnerable. They can be emotional. They're self-absorbed. They're inquisitive. They, um, they're, in, they're also very engaging and very interesting. These are tweens. This is a time that they may feel torn between the safety and security of family and the excitement of being with friends. So they're exploring, they're pushing a little bit of boundaries. At this point, tone is everything. Think discussion, not lecture, so that they will be more engaged and more open to have those conversation. And what we often um, suggest is to focus on smoking, alcohol, and cannabis, um, as these are most often the first substances tweens will try. Um, ask them what do they know? How do they get the, this information? How do they know if it's reliable, right? This is a teachable moment anyways of knowing where to get their information and, and who and, and, and where is it from and, and if it's reliable. Um, you can communicate that you're concerned about substance use and be honest if you don't have all the information. Um, you know, it's okay to say, tell you the truth, I'm not completely up to date, um, but we can find out together. Um, and this is a good time as well to look at what's what's their common um, perception on things and debunk some of the myths, right? So they may come up and say, well, I hear vaping is a lot more safer. It's safer than smoking. And then being able to talk about that. Or, you know, I hear that it's not as dangerous to smoke cannabis and drive than it would be to, um, than it would be to drink and drive. So being able to um, share the information on that and understanding the risks behind it is a great age to introduce that at 9 to 12. High school, 13 to 18. They're social, they're emotional, they're defiant, they're passionate, they're independent. They're definitely testing the boundaries. Um, this is a pivotal age. It's one of the most exciting and maybe even <laughs> most challenging for parents at this point. They're developing their own individuality, their ideals, they dream, their, their dreams. They may be passionate about a cause, um, a sport, or really anything that interests them. So this is where it's important to um, really, uh, if you haven't done so at this point, to start talking about drug use. Um, 
pick a time that you're both agreeing on, that you're both comfortable talking about it. It's okay, again, to um, seek their approval to say, let's talk about this at this time, not like not approval to talk about it ever, and being consistent of it's important for, for us to talk about it, but let's pick a time that both of us, um, it's, it's suitable. And, uh, and, and also once you've have initiated that, that discussion, because they're going to be exposed to potential use to their friends using, um, to videos, to music, to keep the door open saying, I'm always here when you want to talk about it. Um, and make sure that they know, uh, that, that you're available and you want to talk about them again, alcohol, nicotine, and cannabis are the most widely consumed substances by teens. Um, the popularity of vaping is increasing. So spend extra time talking about these substances. What are their opinions about it? Um, and why do they feel this way? Um, I would also like to introduce at this point that, you know, we're, we're talking about safety a lot and reducing risk and reducing harms. This is a good time as well to talk to your kids and let them know that they can always come to you if they don't feel that they're safe or they, um, uh, they need to come home for some reason or, or they misjudge uh, what was happening with them, whether it includes substance use or not. So have some code words, they can call you, you can take the blame, um, text you saying, you know, I need to come home, but then for them to, to show up, you can call and say, you know, you forgot your keys or he forgot their keys. My code word at home is my kids can call me and say that they forgot their keys. So again, not to lose face. I know that it's time to go pick them up because they're they're not feeling 100% safe. It's about developing strategies really in anticipation of what could go wrong, right? So introducing that in the conversation about looking at different scenarios before a moment of crisis and saying what could go wrong, what could happen, what are the different scenarios you could be exposed to. Let's walk through some of the ways that you could find a solution to this. And again, young adults so maybe some of the parents tonight are parents as well of young adults who have left and you know have shifted to post-secondary world um these these kids are still kids and they're still as we said the brain doesn't fully develop until the age of 25. um they're finding out how to have coping mechanism to face stress and anxiety and boredom and all of a sudden um, at this age, some of the substances are available to them and accessible and legal. How do you make sure that, you know, they're not using those substances as a, as a coping mechanism is to check on them and see how they're doing it. You know, an easy question of saying, are you stressed these days? If they start, you know, a new university, a new year, uh, move into an apartment, check on them. Um, if you're still a parent and being able to say, you know, how do you really stress these days? What's going on? So being able to check on them and again, let them know that you'll always be there and, uh, and they can always talk to you. Tips for act active listening. I was talking about timing. So when a cri I, I call it a crisis, but if your kid comes home and they're visibly impaired or something happened, um, make sure they're safe. But if they're safe, this is definitely not the time to start a conversation about substance use. Um, it's okay to say, okay, um, I, I, I see that you're not very well right now. We're going to talk about this later. It also allows you to put your emotions in check and being able to revisit how you're going to, how you're going to address this, right? So it's a matter of letting the emotions go down, being able to share your disappointment the next day is fine. Um, but just make sure that you're both at a place where you can actually have a conversation that emotions are not going to get in the way or override anything that you need to say and override your message and just maybe shut down your chances of ever having an, a, an open dialogue about it, which is my second point, encourage dialogue. So you can say, you know, that you're concerned, um, that, you know, there's some risk inherent with their behavior and, and that you love them. Um, but you know, encourage dialogue. Like, why do you think that I reacted this way last night? Why do you think I'm, I'm concerned? Like being able to bring them in the conversation, use open-ended questions. Um, so why do you feel that, why do you think I feel this way? Um, tell me more about what happened yesterday. Like 
really bringing them to share more than a simple yes or no, because then it becomes a quick conversation. Summarize what you heard. It's one of the, 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 the tips of any active listening, even in the business world or, or at work, or um, is being able to paraphrase. So if I hear you correctly, you know, last night, um, you were really stressed about going to this party, which ended up, you know, you drinking a little too much because you, you felt more at ease when you when you had a couple beers in you and you felt more um, capable of, of going and talk to people because you were shy. Did I hear that correctly? Let them being able to say, no, that's not what I said at all. Or yes, you're right. But by doing this, you're actually showing that you're listening and you can get them in and, and validate what you're saying because they feel that you actually did really listen. Be sincere, that may, that may be able to say, I'm hearing a lot of things and, and it's very challenging to me to hear those things today, but thank you for being honest with me. This is a way of being sincere. Stay positive, <laughs> not always easy, and show empathy and compassion. You know, I hear you, it's not easy. You went to a party, you didn't know anybody. I feel like that sometimes and you were shy. Maybe there's other ways. Maybe let's walk through other ways that you could address this when next time you go to a party so you don't feel compelled to drink and over drink to be able to go and socialize with your friends. Um, one of my last few slides is really suggesting. So again, all of these, you know, it all depends on your family context, where you are. We're suggesting some terms, um, but it's not a, a rigid, script it's not meant to be like that it's just to help you along the way of having those conversation but you know but instead of saying but um you could say you know you did like like for example you did well on your report card but i see that you know you really didn't do well at, in math at all um could be you did well on your report card and i know that you can work even harder um again these are suggestions on setting a positive um, tone to the conversation instead of you know saying should you you know you 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 should um, uh, be doing XYZ you we could say I would like I would like to talk about why you smoke cannabis can we explore this together can we look at maybe other healthy alternatives um, bad harmful you know smoking smoking weed is bad I'm concerned because smoking weed is harmful. There's some risk for your health. Um, so it's not so much a moral judgment as well as a place of concern. And as a parent, I'm concerned about you. Um, smoking weed is stupid. Again, instead of judging, talking about the health aspect, I know that smoking weed is unhealthy. And most definitely it's unhealthy for a teenager and I can share with you what I found out about the risk for your brain, for example. Um, I disapprove of your behavior. I disapprove of what you've been doing. Again, coming from a place of concern, kids know that we care, right? That's why they say that they rely on the information we give them about substance use. So telling them that we're concerned will actually strike a chord better than just telling them that we disapprove or that we're disappointed. Again, coming, I don't want to say the old guilt trip, um, but showing them that we're worried. I'm concerned. I'm worried about what's going on with your life. I want the best for you. I love you. Can we talk about this? So in a, in a quick um, uh, uh, nutshell, it, these are some of the tips and, and hopefully um, you can apply some of what you saw tonight on, on uh, some of the strategies and tactics you can use to use the information and talk about it. Um, as, as I said, we want to normalize the conversation. We want um, kids to feel at ease to talk about it and not be intimidated. And one of the example that we use too is, um, I, I live in Ottawa. There are so many cannabis shops that are opening. Um, you know, in some neighborhoods, there's more cannabis stores than Tim Hortons in Ottawa. Um, share that as, a, as an interesting fact. Like, you know, um, with your teen saying, I'm seeing, you know, that there's a lot of cannabis stores that open lately. What do you think is the business model behind that? Why do you think that is? Do you think it's a profitable business? Like just being able to normalize it in a conversation without having to address directly 
usage right off the bat will ease uh, will ease you into having a, a dialogue um, that is not as intimidating. So I'll uh, I'll return it to Andrea at this point. <laughs> um, were there any questions for Steve or Chantal? I did see a Go couple ahead, come up. Um, that Andrea posted a little while ago to me, uh, one about cannabis interactions with ADHD medications. Um, one of the things I know in the research about cannabis and ADHD is it, it's generally recommended that individuals that are currently experiencing ADHD would be, I'm not going to say not well served, but it's generally recommended that they don't use cannabis or if they do, they use in lower, lower sort of potency levels. Um, one of the things that's that's perceived about, about cannabis is that it may improve focus. And that may be a reason that people would consider using cannabis. Uh, when it comes to focus, one thing that research has shown that is that cannabis may help with sort of what's called like almost like an individual focus, almost like a tunnel vision. Um, but the problem is, is the ability to sort of shift focus and multitask and, and respond to sudden changes and be flexible to changes. Those are the things that get complicated by cannabis use. And they're also the things that tend to be complicated with ADHD. Or ADD. So it's generally recommended that individuals that are, are living with those conditions would either avoid or, or limit the use of cannabis. And if they are using to look for lower potency products, because the product itself, like I said, could actually worsen some of the symptoms of their condition. Um, when it comes with, uh, with cannabis and migraine medication, um, it would likely depend on the medication itself. First of all, I know that that in the states, um, CBD can actually be prescribed in some states as an anti-inflammatory for people that are unable to take things like ibuprofen um, due to issues with, I believe it's with their kidneys, um, because ibuprofen can have a little bit of an adverse reaction to, to, to kidneys with people that have a little bit of a history of kidney damage. Um, but again, it's generally recommended if an individual is, is experiencing migraines that they should be consulting with a doctor anyways, and really sort of trying to figure out what, what it is that maybe is causing those. Um, some of the research that we've seen about cannabis and migraines, uh, for instance, out of, out of Colorado is, is a little bit flawed in that people see that it, you know, 85% of people that use cannabis reported improving conditions, but they didn't actually really take into consideration that only actually about 20% of them were, were actually following the, the protocols of the, the study that this was actually referring to. So most people were just sort of using in different amounts. Some people were barely using at all. Some people were other ta also taking other medications. So research on, on cannabis and, and headaches and migraines is another thing that, that still requires more, more knowledge or, or, or awareness at this time. If I may um, jump in, Andrea, just because I, I, I haven't seen any questions come in, but there's one recurring question that usually shows up in most of our webinars, and it's parents asking if they should provide their teens with alcohol or cannabis to avoid them getting it from somewhere else or feeling that it, it will be safer um, if they can monitor usage at home. And we've directed this question to um, some of the uh, psychologist researchers that sit on our advisory board. And the answer that came back is that it, it hasn't played out in the research that they have done, that all of a sudden, because parents are introducing alcohol at home, that it will result in more responsible drinkers down the line. So basically, the way that they have um, done their studies and, and, and looked at the research is that kids who had access to alcohol um, from their parents um, had the same risks of harmful drinking as kids that accessed it from, from other sources. So drinking at home um, didn't make them more responsible or didn't prevent them from being binge drinkers down the line. Um, it didn't really have any incident, uh, like incidents on, on, on their own consumption. So that's the research that we have. So then it's, it's, it's up to parents after to make those decisions. But if that decision was based on, well, I'm gonna make them more responsible drinkers, the studies that have been done through the University of Toronto didn't show that. So that I just wanted to share that with you because it's one question that comes up. And as well, what was shown in the studies is by being more permissive, however, was actually normalizing even more consumption with kids. So they were less likely to consider um, some of the risky behaviors inherent with um, drinking 
or using cannabis as some as the other kids that didn't have the open permission from their parents. I was going to say, I just saw one pop up. What do you think of peer support groups for parents of kids who are abusing substances and suffering the effects of abuse or, or higher uh, risk use? Do you, do you want to take this one first, Chantal? Go ahead, because I'm not sure. I have to reread the question to make sure I understand it. The first thing I was going to say, just looking at it, actually, it's uh, one of the resources right on our website is, is the Parent Support Hub. Um, if, if we're looking at support groups for parents of, of kids of using substances, that's, that's one of the great things that, that DFK offers is having that resource there to, to help parents, to, to empower parents and, and to give them the research and knowledge as well, right? Uh, what we did tonight is to try to share as much of that information as we could. I apologize for my dogs having a meltdown with the kids playing baseball in the backyard, but, uh, it was, it was a little distracting here, but I certainly hope it wasn't too much during the presentation. But um, what I was going to say is, is that, that that need for support is, is there for parents just as much as it is for, for youth. We offer so many resources and, and projects to support kids. I think it's great when we're able to have these kinds of discussions with groups of parents. Um, so the idea of peer support groups is, is helpful. And again, having a resource like the Parent Support Hub, which is available right on our website, and I can grab the link for it because I think I actually have it sitting right uh, right here. And I can definitely but share I, that into the chat panel. And I think that parents reaching out and being supported themselves is super important. So great if they come to the Parent Support Hub, but a peer group of parents living with similar experiences um, has been proven to be very helpful. You don't feel as isolated. You can share your experience. So Again, um, there's several groups. There's, there's, there's some um, resources on our, directly on our website, but there's a lot of valid resources out there for parents to get support um, from other families that have lived with similar situations. And it, it's, it's funny, it, it reminds me of, of, of research when we look at um, supporting peers with education, right? When, when young people are learning, not just like youth, but like teens, young adults, people taking on new roles. Um, quite often, quite often research has shown that the people that tend to be the most supportive or, or offer the most direct support for someone that has a question is someone who's likewise tackling the same issue or recently has tackled that issue themselves. So those, those peer support groups become all the more important because you're speaking with someone whose empathy feels a little bit more real because, because they're right there too. Um, my, my sister's not going to come to me for parenting advice. I don't have kids, but she'll go and have a conversation with her friend who also has children around the same age because they get to share their experiences with one another. And it can be similar with substance. We have another question. How do you get help for substance abuse for your kids if they don't think there is a problem? Um, that's a really good question. And, and, I, and, and I feel for you if, if that's what's happening for you because your, your heart is breaking and you wanna help and you wanna support, but they're not seeing the problem. Um, there's a lot of interesting statistics that can be found on our website. 90% of people struggling with addiction in adulthood started using in adolescence, right? So being able to share those stats, being able to share the concern as to why you're concerned, it's, as I said, it's not a matter of a moral um, uh, judgment to be able to say it's wrong, or it's being able to say, this is why I'm concerned. This is how it's impacting you. Um, this is how it's impacting your brain. These are the risks inherent to um, to misusing substances and sharing those concerns and leaving the door open at the end of the day is to be able to say, I'm very much concerned. These are the stats that are out there. I want to keep you safe. Um, and, uh, and you can come to me and, you know, you can provide resources for them to use on their own. Um, if for some reason there's some limitations that they're embarrassed or there's stigma attached to going to their parents, but you can, you know, you can share with them why you do think there's a problem. They may not see that there is, but you as a parent, you, you may be able to say, let me share with you why I'm concerned. And it's not just because I think it's wrong, it's because I think these are the risks inherent to whatever substance that they're being faced with. And just to add on to that, I, I really like that you, you mentioned the idea of, of if you have resources to share with them. One of the other things that, that I've seen in research from, from the CCSA, the Canadian Center on Substance Use and Addictions, is the idea that if you're sharing resources with youth, it also helps for you to look a little bit into those yourself, so that if they look through them and they have questions or they have something you want to know, you have a little bit more of a frame of reference to continue that conversation. 
to really keep establishing that trust that I want you to take a look at this resource on DFK's website. I've taken a look and I saw this part right here. And that way you're both able to have that conversation with a little bit more sort of mutual knowledge there. If any other questions come up and uh, you need support, you're more than welcome to come to our website and use the Parent Support Hub. It's, it's, it's a chat line as well as a phone line 24-7 um, where you speak to a, 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 a representative who understands substance use and can refer um, parents and kids to uh, a psychotherapist for up to five sessions. And we and that's free because we know that there's currently waiting lists depending on where you live between 12 to 24 months to access public um, mental health support. So um, this is free of use and these people can help you wherever you are in your journey. So you can come and ask questions about how to engage in a conversation, just exactly like this question, what if they don't see if there's a problem and the parent can feel supported, right? So at the beginning, it can only be for the parent to be able to feel better at, 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 at ease to know where to go and find resources. So it could be even as a first point of reference for them to go to. Um, but it, as I said, it doesn't have to be, I need to have access to resources. It can simply be, I don't know where to start or I don't know how to address this. And, uh, and they can get support on a website through that. And there's other, through a website, again, there's other resources. It doesn't have to be the Parent Support Hub. There's other provincial resources that are available as well. Absolutely. There was there was one other question I saw in the email that I, I know we didn't really get a chance to touch on directly in the presentation. I alluded to it once or twice. There was a question about youth and, and overdose in high school. And, and Chantal and I were talking about this earlier today. And one of the things that, that we talked about is, is the idea that overdose doesn't always mean fatality, right? When we, when we look at, at fentanyl, I can, I can give you the data from 2021. We know in Ontario that there were 224 opioid-related deaths of youth age 15 to 24, and 89% of all toxicity deaths did include fentanyl. But to call overdose consistently fatal, and that being the, the one risk of, of overdose, is, is actually neglecting some of the other things about overdose in and of itself, because an overdose doesn't necessarily mean the substance necessarily killed a person. In some cases, overdose is just simply that the person has consumed more than they're capable of handling. We can see cannabis overdoses, which can result in things like uh, psychotic or substance-induced psychotic episodes, which can last for a period of up to 30 days or more. And this is not just someone having a bad trip. This is someone who's experiencing delusions, paranoia, symptoms of psychosis for a period of weeks on end. We can see alcohol poisoning, which is the equivalent of alcohol overdose. It can be fatal, but even if it's not, it can cause uh, blacking out, it can cause memory loss, it can cause uh, damage to the stomach, linings of the stomach and the intestines, a vomiting, um, convulsions. So really when, when you're looking at, at overconsumption and overdose, the, the conversation I think that comes up there is, uh, is really just to talk about the idea that, that it's important to set limits with substances. It's important to avoid mixing them. And if someone is using a substance and they start not feeling well, they need to know that they can contact uh, medical assistance, they can call emergency services if they need to. And even for youth, if they're consuming underage and they they uh, they or someone else they know it begins experiencing, you know, very sort of unpredictable or very negative effects, they can call for emergency medical services under the Good Samaritan Overdose Act without having to worry about facing criminal prosecution for being impaired. So we want them to know that if they do find that they or someone else they know is using a substance and they begin to feel unwell, they can seek medical attention. Well, I think we can all agree uh, that Stephen Chantel's presentation was full of good information and helpful suggestions. And at least I know for me, it was eye-opening. Um, our parent engagement team's goal is always to inform, educate, and empower parents and caregivers. And I hope that on behalf of Chantel and, and Steve that we've helped you do that. Um, as Chantal mentioned earlier, uh, as you sign off after the presentation, you'll see a short survey from Drug Free Kids. We ask that you please just take a moment to fill it out. And also you will be emailed a short survey from our team. We would really appreciate if you could fill that out as well. Um, it help, your feedback helps us evaluate this session as well as plan for future sessions. Um, and if anybody was interested, this session was recorded. And I know um, Drug Free Kids will be providing that link to us. So when that happens, 
uh, it will be posted on our student council website. And those that have registered for tonight's session um, will email you when that link has been posted. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you again for taking time to attend this presentation. Big thank you to Chantal and Steve for giving us their time and expertise. And thank you to Susan, who's in the background there supporting all of us. Um, I'd also like to thank Lucy, my co-chair, who was unable to join us tonight, but she was instrumental in putting this event together with me. And a really big thank you to the Cothra Park administration and the school council for making this event possible. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.